Hi everyone, I'm Neil from A92 Plus and I'm joined today by Emir from Randware. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, hey, Neil, good morning. We're here to be able to talk a little bit about the current landscape around, around DDoS. Um, but if we start, give a little bit of background about yourself and what it is you do at Randware. So my name is Amir Peles. I'm the Executive Vice President of Technology and Engineering. I lead of all of our global team of engineering people working with the customers to qualify the, the, the requirements, architect the solutions, and then of course lead them through the uh, proof of concept, testing of the solution, and then uh, deployment, and, uh, and being uh, and succeeding with the use of the hardware solutions. Right. Smashing, that's great. And um, you know, kind of recently we've kind of Red Rev launched a kind of kind of number of reports and updates in terms of what the current kind of landscape looks like, and there's definitely kind of been a lot of changes. Um, so it'd be interesting to kind of run through some of those main talking points. And I think kind of one of the, the highlights that's come out has been a bit of a shift from um, kind of more commercial based attacks with a, you know a profit motive to something that's a little bit more kind of cause or ideology based. So if you can give us a little bit of the background about that. Yeah. So. You know, uh, I, I'm in this industry for the last uh, 30 years already, so I, I can see the, the shift in, in what's going on. And if the attackers several years ago, you know, just like you and I, uh, moved to working from home, yep. also the criminals, they saw the potential in working from home and uh, moving to, to cyber attacks. And, and we saw also with the use of um, cyber currency, yep. uh, the ability for, <coughs> for the criminals to uh, you know, go to ransom and, and these kind of attacks, ask to get paid by Bitcoin and yep. can go completely under the radar and take the money. So, so that, that was a, 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 a rise in the cyber crime. Yep. And, and we saw such campaigns against uh, many companies with online uh, sales, online presence, uh, to either attacking their business or attacking their branding. Over the last year, with the you know the the shift of the, or, or I would say the, the conflicts that we see around yeah. the world, we see like two weeks before the tanks came from uh, Russia yeah. towards Kiev, we saw uh, huge waves of, of cyber attacks. Right, and then um, and in these cyber attacks, we, we see that the the idea is not only to to attack businesses and, and get money, but really to to attack the critical infrastructure of a country yeah. and uh, all, all the services of the government to the citizens. Uh, you know, it can be the IRS and some people would be very happy if IRS yeah, went down, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but not the country uh, or, or, or any other, uh, I would say, uh, service from the government. So, so these attacks are coming, uh, you know, it, uh, during um, uh, some of these uh, crises we saw not only Russia versus the Ukraine, or uh, I don't know, Iran versus Israel, which is yeah. a bit closer to, to my heart, but it, it could be also many side effects. So if the Canadian Prime Minister goes on the news and he yeah. says, we support the Ukrainians, then uh, an hour after there are attacks from, you know, presumably Russian supporters, and there are many, many such organizations around the world that are just attacking the Russian, the Canadian Prime Minister and the many Canadian uh, government uh, websites uh, with fierce attacks. So, so we, we see the motivation there, you know, it, it could be just activists that are supporting the cause of, of these, yeah. uh, or, uh, I don't know, countries or, or whatever, or it can uh, be actually uh, State financed attacker groups that are being paid to attack the the other country and the moral of the people and just create damage. Yeah, I suppose that kind of that kind of attribution can be a little bit more complicated because, as you say, in kind of recent years, with the, the ability to be able to the massively lowered cost, um, more people being able to access and run these attacks with a rise of kind of quite kind of well known, almost branded uh, kind of uh, kind of. Uh, various different attacking groups and, and syndicates and everything that, that became quite well known and the, the, the kind of modus operandi was kind of quite recognisable, whereas now, not necessarily known whether it's going to be nation state or any one of these kind of distributed activist groups, does make it more complicated and does that make it slightly harder from a defence perspective because it, it's kind of a little bit less predictable. Yeah. 
I, I will tell you that the, from a technology perspective to block the attacks, it's, a, uh, the, the, it's the same methodology whether <coughs> you attack a, a business or, or you attack uh, some, you know, it's a country finance. But it's definitely went much wider yeah. from, from the scope of, uh, of protection and the scope of attack that we see. And the, the resources that were put into developing newer attack tools, uh, we, we definitely see the shift in the last year with many more tools and more advanced tools going not only uh, against the wide network, but actually going on specific applications and trying to, to, to damage the, the application. Right. So, you know, the, maybe the more visible are attacks as part of, the, of, of this uh, military conflict. Yeah. But I would say the damage, even to enterprises, you know, we have a, a banking customer, which is a, a public company, and they were uh, attacked, attacked for some reason, just the, the week that they were about to push their financial results right. uh, to the stock exchange. So, so you can understand the, the pressure and uh, you know, some, some, uh, that it creates on the customer and the need, of course, to be protected. And, and it was the same tools that we saw two months before yeah. with the Russian attacking the Ukrainians. So, right. so you know, maybe Russia is financing this, uh, the, the creation of the tools yeah. in order to attack the Ukraine, but then the Russian, uh, whoever is behind this tool set, is also selling it to, uh, to criminals. To have funded, to yeah. yeah. Yes, so, I, I so, suppose so you so can, yeah. can make money. <laughs> yeah. So, so the funding on the country level allows much better uh, or advanced tools for, for attacks. Yeah. It's really weapons, you know, today it's weapons. It's like any other weapon. Yeah, and, and organizations of all types can obviously get caught up in it. So obviously, you know, we know that there's gonna be elements of, uh, of state organizations that are gonna be attacked, you know, whether it's kind of those primary targets, or as you mentioned, for example, with Canada, it could be, you know, kind of an associated supporter, but I suppose, any any organisations that's you know increasingly we talk about supply chain attacks, but it's also anyone that's kind of linked to help support it. So you know that obviously could be things like critical national infrastructure, or it could be supply routes, or any organisations that's perceived as getting involved in anything that's kind of part of any of these any of these conflicts can can potentially get sucked in. So I suppose organisations as part of their cybersecurity strategy, I suppose, need to keep a keep a perspective on what their organisations kind of broader visibility is and what else they're getting involved in from a from a PR and a and a, and a kind of public perception side of things mm -hmm. so it's you know a big kind of big challenge for them and so you know it because of the, the these sorts of attacks are the other are tactics changing a little bit in terms of the, the sort of attacks in terms of you know kind of how the you know the the way in which organizations are being attacked is that evolving because of some of these changes yeah so it's definitely we saw you know over the last several years where people had their links to the internet in the data center uh, with fixed capacity before moving to public cloud. You know, yeah. the, the most effective attack would be just to overwhelm the capacity of the link, right? Yeah. And, and we saw attacks coming from you know, gigabits of uh, traffic to 10 gigabits to hundreds of gigabits and terabits of, uh, yeah. of, of bandwidth uh, per second, bits per second that are sent against destinations. I think the, these volumetric attacks that they they create uh, damage, they, they cost money to 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 block, but they in order to generate these attacks, it's also cost a lot of money to generate the attacks. Yeah. And uh, I think those are uh, we still see many of them, but w what we saw over the last year is is a change. So the the, the change is rather than attacking all of your network with a very high volume of, yeah. of traffic and taking you out of service just, I would say, uh, brutally, which became less effective with the capacity in, in the cloud uh, yeah. that, that can handle these attacks. We see more surgical attacks against and against the applications. Right. So okay. over the last year, I would say, we saw this tool set in, in the campaigns from uh, the, whether the political or the cyber criminal uh, campaigns yeah. to bring down applications. And to bring down application, you need to, of course, you have to generate requests to that application, but with the botnets that are available, it, it's, it's very cheap 
to do and it's enough to bring down an application with a, even a 50 megabit which is I guess at your home you yeah, have yeah, 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 yeah. higher capacity so, yeah. so you can take from your home you can generate an attack that will bring down the, yeah. I don't know the, the big bank here in the UK so so th these volumes are, uh, are, are, are very challenging to to detect and to protect so yeah. a lot of you know the service providers which were the dominant protectors from this kind of side of, of DDoS attacks yeah. you know, they are less effective because for them it's a needle in the in the hay yeah. I'm using the right uh, yeah, no, terminology yeah. and uh, so, so just to detect it, it it's very challenging for them and and then this is why the the protection you really have to be more to, to develop protections as a business or as a country against these attacks with uh, you know much more professional, uh, I would say, uh, entities to protect you, like Rago. And, yeah. and we see many, many businesses are coming to us and to our uh, cloud service protection yeah. because of this problem. The, the, the old solutions with the service providers to just protect the volumetric attacks is just not enough. Yeah. And the attacks today are against the applications. Yeah, because you, you're not, you, I suppose you're not going to get that, that as much of an alert warning because the because previously obviously the sheer volume would have been there would have been a lot of triggers that would have been kind of highlighted and people would have been able to kind of you know kind of potentially kind of prepare. So obviously yeah, they're kind of quite specific attacks, but I, there's kind of greater focus on kind of elements within that application. Therefore, in terms of I suppose organisations need to focus on what the, the key priorities are that they need to be defending. Is it, it, does that also kind of make it a bit easier that they're not having to protect such a wide potential kind of, that there's not as much of an attack surface. It's more likely that they can predict what sort of applications kind of, you know, the attackers are likely to target. Yeah, the, I would say it's mainly the landing pages, right. and the internet facing websites that you have to protect yeah. so from, a, from an organization perspective. Still, you have to protect your, uh, I would say, the wide surface of your yes. connectivity, so yes. it's not that you don't need it, but uh, on, on the applications, that, that would be the, the required protection. You have to select the top five, ten websites yes. that, that you own and, uh, and, and focus on protecting them. Right, okay, yeah. So, and, and are they kind of, it, it, often the targets and when they're going for applications, is it still kind of like just a, you know, an attack to be able to take it down? Or is it still kind of compromising in terms of potential kind of exposing data or secrets or, or, or even still using that as a conduit to be able to kind of jump from there onto a network to do something else? Or is it just literally kind of trying to take down and as cause as much kind of collateral damage as they can? So. You know, some of the denial of service attacks are, are more to make a small screen right. so they can uh, do something yeah. on, the, on the back end and I don't know, eventually still the, the big damage is in doing account takeover attacks. So let's yeah. say that I'm, I can get access by identifying your username and password and then I, as an attacker, I go with a legitimate identity into the, into the website and, and then it's easier to let's say, uh, infiltrate yeah. initially, and then m move from uh, one machine to the other and then do very high collateral damage. But, but in order to uh, to do that, just coming at the application, bringing it down, and especially if, if I'm a country, you know, I, I, I don't, I have less interest in the credit card numbers of yeah, your uh, yeah. customers, yeah. but I do want you down, because it shows that I won. Yeah. And uh, we, we see, by the way, as, as part of the, recent conflict between Israel and the Hamas, there is, uh, uh, they're trying to come into websites and, and deface the website. So, yes. So yeah. they're in a, I don't know, the, an Israeli basketball team website to yeah. become a, a, a Hamas site. And, and that's that's a win, you know, it, it goes into yeah. the uh, morale of people and, uh, you know, yeah, we won, we were able to infiltrate an Israeli site even though not a, a very important one, but, no. but, but it's a win. So yeah. for them, it's less on what, what credit card data they could take or, I don't know, names of the fans of the basketball team, yeah. but it's, it's really the fact yeah. that okay. the, the okay. site is yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and kind of one of the other things that kind of got highlighted in the report as well is, is their ability to be able to kind of take over and, and use, you know, what we consider to be legitimate tools or elements on the website, or even kind of you know getting around kind of capture elements, which I suppose we've you know it's become very well known. We're all used to it. We probably don't like 
you know, clicking on pictures of buses and bridges. Um, but it's been, we've become well used to it as being kind of part of that, uh, part of a, you know, an application in terms of verification of uh, identity and security. But but now attackers are beginning to kind of leverage some of those legitimate tools as well, which kind of you know makes it even more of a challenge for organisations having to rethink what they're doing from an application security perspective. Yeah, yeah actually this is a, a favourite subject for me, right. so the, because the, this capture it can be very, very advanced on one hand, but we did see it in, in one of the, the, the customers we were protecting, we, we couldn't understand why the capture is being bypassed so easily. Right. Then we, it turned out that the attacker was running a porn site on the right. backend. And every time this captcha was presented by the site that we protected, it, it just placed that captcha image on the, right. on the porn site, and okay. then immediately a legitimate get, person was straight on wanted it. to keep seeing the right. video, wow. and, and he okay. was uh, typing the captcha correctly and, and bypass it. And, and basically, so whether that captcha or uh, you know where we have to see the, the traffic lights or, yep. uh, or uh, trains and buses and, and bicycles, etc. For me and for Adwell, it, it puts the annoyance on the legitimate users, yeah, rather yeah, than absolutely. putting the annoyance on the on, on the attacker. So what we what we invest in are, are one of our main tools that we're doing. I call it the counter attack tool. Right. That when when we get a, when we see that an attack is starting, basically we start to attack the user with. Yeah what we call a crypto challenge. Right. So that, that challenge is when we generate, um, we require from the user machine, yeah. nothing from the user in personal himself, but we're generating a mathematical function, right. okay. which if we see more and more and more requests from that user, which is definitely a, yeah. a bot, we make the mathematical function more complex. And right. it requires okay. more resources from the bot machine yeah. in order to uh, to go through that challenge, do the mathematical function, and of course when you do it more you have to sweat and sweat and sweat and it just yeah. becomes very very costly yeah. for the attacker. Slow and costly. Yeah. As, as, and so, I'm sure speed on a lot of these things is is key for them because they need to do the attack, get, make the attack done quickly before it's. Recognized by defenses, and it's different if it costs you one hundred dollars to run an attack versus yep. it costs you thousands of dollars because of yep. the CPU concern. So, so that unique algorithm of Radu, which we call the crypto challenge, is, yep. is a key. And and really, rather than annoying the your legitimate users, yep. when when you are under attack, we want to annoy the attackers and get them off your, your off your back and yep. go go find another target. So I suppose it's kind of, it, it's interesting kind of them still relying on kind of humans to be able to solve those those challenges and obviously it feels almost impossible to have a conversation kind of right now about anything technology and especially cyber security without mentioning kind of AI. Are you, in terms of have you kind of AI used by attackers and, and, and you know kind of bad actors to be able to to, to automate a lot of those processes, to replace humans, to be able to speed up and to be able to give them scale. Is that something you're seeing? Is that a kind of, is that another kind of risk element for, for organizations in terms of kind of defending against application security, putting putting these sorts of measures in place where bad actors can potentially kind of leverage AI in that way? Yeah, so definitely AI allows you to bypass a lot of the human challenges uh, in our world. Was just meeting a customer, and their, their challenge is actually a, a speaking challenge. Right. And there, it was a foreign language that is not supported by uh, by the challenge oh. system. Yeah. And you know, if, if the person doesn't speak English, you need to start challenging him in uh, in his own language. Yeah. So you just see the the challenge on legitimate users, and actually these challenges, if the attacker uses AI, he can easily bypass it. Yeah. Right? So that's yeah. a so many of the, these uh, captchas and other ways to, to authenticate users are becoming ineffective because of AI, and it just requires more, uh, I would say, imagination and creativity from companies like Radwell, you know, to, to, to do the, uh, this example that I mentioned, the counter attack, yeah. and, and really attack the, the, the attackers on, on ways that AI, and, and I would say uh, them, trying to um, 
behave like humans yes. will, will, will not it is, is out of the equation because to, today AI, with AI many times the attackers are more human than actual humans yes yeah absolutely so in terms of kind of how you see organizations kind of you know both commercial and, and kind of governmental ones as well having to kind of change their strategy kind of what's what's important in terms of you know kind of looking forward in terms of being able to adapt what they're doing in terms of being able to make sure that their cybersecurity posture is is kind of fit for you know what the the evolving threat landscape looks like what are the kind of key elements that organizations need to need to make sure that they're addressing yeah. so the, definitely they need to be uh, to, to map what is important to them because yeah. you can protect everything but yeah. it's uh, an endless uh, but at least on the assets where they find uh, which are important, they need to have what we call always on protection. So, yeah. so these should have the best protection all the time, even when there is no attack. For the rest of the network, there is a, what we call on-demand uh, right. model. Yeah. So uh, at least make sure you have a security company and supplier, or actually many suppliers, because uh, you don't you cannot protect just part of your, uh, your your infrastructure, but make sure that you have the vendor that upon need will be able to protect you. Yeah. So then uh, I would say this is uh, the, the most important thing. Map, map your infrastructure, whatever needs always on protection and whatever you can do on demand. Okay. And then kind of going into into next year, if I can kind of you know, get you to look into the crystal ball in terms of kind of how you see kind of you know the continual changes and, and maybe some trends and patterns and things that we need to look out for but kind of how do you see that kind of you know the landscape evolving next year yeah. so I, I can tell you i see many many companies who are uh, kind of moving their infrastructure and data center and applications to the public cloud yeah. and they have the impression that the public cloud vendors can protect them but, but we see that actually this moving into the public cloud creates even more exposure because the public cloud, the, the attackers can put applications there, they can uh, learn and research what, what are the existing APIs and uh, uh, how the infrastructure is working because it's a public infrastructure basically. Yeah. So, so attacks on the public cloud are, are even easier to perform than yeah. attacks on, on, on whatever you have in your private cloud uh, or your uh, data centers. So I, I would say to, to everybody, uh, make sure you have the right yeah. security for what is important for you and, and don't just trust the general protection of the public cloud because we, we, we saw that even Azure was down for several days yeah. when LinkedIn was under attack uh, and, and, the, and the other Office 365 services. Yeah. So uh, actually that infrastructure is even more exposed than whatever you have today. For. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I think that's you know, really, really useful. Uh, we'll, for everybody listening, we'll provide copies um, and links to the report um, and the webinar will make that available. So click below the video to find out more. Um, but for now, thank, thank you, you very everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you.